Ow, baby. I didn't want to interrupt the audio, but I saw your guys' questions. Uh, how many tracks? Reggae JR says, uh, JR, cool, very cool name. A lot of people call me JR. Excuse my mix asks how many tracks, but uh, yeah, uh, 206 stems for this song. This stuff was all uh, MD directed by Berna's band, the uh, Outsiders musical director, Emmanuel, uh, the drummer. Uh, monster drummer, just insane gospel chops. That, that dude's just <laughs> amazing. So, yeah, so they took all the album stuff, added a live band, live orchestra, live choir, not necessarily live orchestra, but live string section. And it's just just mom and thanks everybody for bearing with me and with my horrible twitch streaming skills it's been six months since i streamed you guys it's been a real real long time but uh, i thought now would be a really cool time to kind of dig in on the reference mix and what they sent me was was like this you know we're gonna a b using plugin alliance adapter metric a b plugin this is by far the biggest tool that I use. It's amazing. I love it. So we're going to flip through the tune and kind of listen to the reference mix, which will be orange, B, and the current finished final mix, blue, A. Yeah, let's like just jump somewhere into the song. This one I do. Yeah, so that's kind of the deal with, uh, you know, A being between the two. Uh, so now we should jump in and kind of find out what we did to achieve that separation, wideness, kind of a little bit more of that dynamic uh, punch. Uh, Reggae Jr. asks, did they send you a Pro Tools session or did you have to import the files and do additional prep work to consolidate, organize the session? Uh, yeah, this came in all as just stems. And some of them were grouped, processed, and then they also gave me, like, for example, like the choir, you know, there was... 50 different vocal tracks and then they would send me like their mix of the vocal tracks and um i believe in every instance i just you know started from scratch and used the dry stuff like the first place i start on a mix like this is the drums so yeah this type of music as i i, I would categorize it as, uh, as as far as the rhythm section goes like this is a gospel rhythm section this is this is gospel chops stuff and uh as far as the tonality to the parts and the musical direction like this is that's kind of how this should be mixed. Just solo out our kick and see what's going on. Pretty sweet. Uh, let's hear in the mix. Reference. Yeah, so you know we kind of achieved a good amount of space and and punch. Uh, a couple of questions I see from you guys: Was this mixed all in the box? Yes, one hundred percent in the box. Um, no outboard of any kind for anything. Um, normally I'll use some some outboard for inserts and stuff. Um, but yeah, not not now. Yeah, Paul, I'm using NS10s at the moment because. Uh, so this will be like the last stream that I do in this studio before I move into the bigger space. Uh, we've been doing a big garage conversion studio build in our backyard here in L.A. And it's it's coming along. It's close. They're almost done mudding, so I'm going to go in there and do some paint next week, put in the flooring, and then start to build out the treatment and bring in my beloved tube traps. 
and uh, as well as these Strauss MF4 monitors. And But uh, to kind of fund a lot of this project, I had to sell the near-field Strauss that I had, which is truly sad. <laughs> really miss these. But uh, The NS10s are, are working really well. My buddy Gerhard helped me tune and dial in these NS10s, and I have never heard NS10s sound like this. They're ridiculous. Um, like low end all the way down, crossing over to the sub at 45 hertz. So, you know, these are providing that low end extension and just, you know, between the combination of, of putting these in this array, this configuration of, of tubes, it really helps to just maintain a lot of the low end that you would normally lose out of this enclosure or that they just really don't produce because they start to roll off around 100 hertz, I believe. Uh, you slap the rough mix in the face. Mix Giant. Shout out Mix Giant. That's Noah Glassman. That is my assistant. He's the man. He is a already a legend, but absolute future monster legend, mixer, and producer, musician, guitar player, lady slayer, all of the above. Love you, man. You're the best. Uh, what happened to the Strauss speakers? Yeah, I just said that. I'm a little behind on these. Thank you guys for uh, for lighting up the chat, man. This is awesome. I'm horrible at Twitch streaming, so <laughs> this might be extremely boring for some of you, but we're going we're gonna to rock. We're going to rock on, baby. Okay, like let's see where our faders are on the song. Kind of all over the place, but I started with everything up at zero and just kind of dialed in this kit as I went. And I will solo things a little bit, but I try to dial things in in the mix. That's, that's really going to tell you the most. You need all that context. You need the relational kind of just context. You need to know how it's how things are working with other elements. Uh, so we had a kick out, but they sent me two kicks, which was really interesting, a kick out and a kick sub, a sub kick mic. And normally there's a kick in that would go along with that too. So I, I'll kind of explain the role that I, I typically treat kicks. And it's that the kick in handles the mi upper mids and the top and kind of that just thickness and, and punch that helps cut through in the top end. And then, you know, a kick out or a kick sub or together, those kind of tr help provide oomph in the low end. Um, there was no kick in mic, so I provided a sample that I really like to use for that. Um, here's the kick out. This is where I started. And uh, I'll expand our track view so we can see all the plugins going on and everything. So I had a little pro cue doing some stuff, cutting out some boxiness in the mids. This 3K thing, this is, or it looks like it's 4K. This, if you can hear that, that's the worst. I'm really sensitive to that, and I, I just, I can't stand, like, clicky 3K, 4K kicks. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. I like that energy to be focused a little bit lower and then have a little bit of the presence up above it. And, yeah, so you can see here I, I kind of went for that with Spectre, which this is this great plugin that I learned about from John Castelli. And check out his podcast, Conversations, and uh, Live with Matt Rad. But the, he was always talking about this plugin, and... Uh, I had been a vast user of like Saturn and Isotopic Cider, and this thing just really, it kind of combines all of the best of those things. Um, I'll still use those plugins for certain situations, but uh, yeah, this really, really helped to provide some some stuff. And then we add in the sub kick, which it looks like I added a CLA Mix Hub just for a, uh, just to try using the phase shift, and I didn't need it, so I actually, this plugin isn't doing anything. Uh, next. Yes. There's our kick in. There's some of that like top end, you know. Uh, this is a trigger. Eric Valentine kick. I will proudly, shamelessly, uh, you know, admit that, that, that I use that pretty much all the time. I ripped this straight from his YouTube channel. I like audio hijacked it just right off of, you know, one of his mixing videos. And uh, my assistant, Noah, actually asked me that. He's like, do you ever worry that you're getting, you're using a low-fidelity sample? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Because I'm usually filtering it and only using, like, 1K. It just doesn't matter. Like, I'm just using it to get a little bit of push. And in a mix, like, nobody is ever going to know. Like, Berna didn't hit me back with mix notes saying, we need a higher fidelity mid-range of that kick. I can tell you ripped off the sample right now. It just doesn't matter. Find something you like, sample it, you know? Pull, pull kicks, pull drums out of recordings. Uh, but this thing's obviously providing a bunch of like 1K knock. And I just knocked out the low end. Like if we already have two kicks doing the low end, we don't need more. Truly. Like just, it's just going to mess stuff up. For example, like if I turn this off. Uh, 
it was kind of making a mess. There's a little bit of a, a phase shift happening. A little oomph happened at 100 hertz. No thanks. Uh, another sample going on here. Kick room. Because things get a little bit dry. You guys heard when I soloed the drums. Uh, there's a, a bunch of reverb, a bunch of space going on. And the space on the kick drum needs to be compatible with that, right? So I added in a room sample. Which is, uh, this is a Taylor Larson room sample from his Oceanic Room back in Maryland. Man, I've had this sample for like seven years. I love it. I, I'm, I use that on every single mix too. Is it a one-shot kick? Yeah, yeah, it's just one. I have done it where you, you know, take five or ten or thirty different hits of a kick and then, you know, splice them in wherever, all over the song, and then you get variation. Um, for this, I just really wanted the strength and consistency. Because by having the the kick out and the sub, there are ghost notes with a kick, right? Boom, da, ba boom, boom, ba boom. So like when you have a ghost note like that, which is like what a sixteenth ghost or an eight eighth, depending on the meter, that ghost note is lighter than the hard hit, right? Ba boom. So sometimes the intensity of that would be like fifty, and then the intensity of your hard hit would be like a hundred, hundred and twenty. And uh, I've already have that from these natural kick tracks. So the kick trigger was just able to be in there. And at times, I would automate that down. Let's see if I did. Actually, I did. Sorry. There, we can kind of hear where this happened. Um, let's find out why I did that. Ooh, misfire, you guys. You can hear that right there. Uh, make sure to look out for this. If you're using Slate Trigger, you know, turn up the re-trigger because this happened. There, yeah. It'll, like, misfire you'll get to, and that sounds stupid. Oops. Right up here, later in the song, the live kick comes in to meet the programmed kick, right? And I have it muted. That was just a decision that I made, and sometimes I do stuff like that, and... Sometimes it gets me yelled at. Uh, this time it did not. It just, it worked better this way. Uh, because without it, it sounds like this. Right. You know, and before it comes in, the other programmed kick sounds like this. Yeah, so if we had them both in here, it gets messy. And obviously we have a live, you know, non-quantized track versus this, you know, programmed one that's basically gridded or maybe not gridded, but yeah, so I just got rid of it. That worked. Uh, to answer your question, Paul, yes, did some gating. Did some gating uh, on the snare. Let's take a look. Let's go back to yay at the end because that's just a better spot to hang on this. You know, because without everything. Fab Filter Pro G, just gating, get the release and the hold time right to kind of get the breath of the drum. And then a little bit of Spectre just to add some top end in. And I did not make that move. Oops. Wherever that was, I'm sure that's fine. I didn't make this move until I think my last mix revision. It just felt like it needed a bit more snap up top. And generally, I rely on the snare bottom mic or like a snare sample that treats the top end uh, to kind of give me more of that sizzle. And for whatever reason... In the mix, this was just cool. I just tried it and it worked out. Uh, yeah, so we got snare top. Uh, trigger two, snappy room. What is snappy room? I think this is from the 1985 pack. No, it's not. It's uh, Paul Mabry. Snares, snappy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shout out that sound, Paul Mayberry. Awesome. And let's see, do I have my D-verbs going? Not yet. Yeah, that's a little bit of a sample added in. Snare bottom. Got to get all that articulation and ghost notes going on. 
Reggae Jr. just asked, how did I go about handling the tempo variations through the song? Really good question. So uh, we start with 92 BPM for level up. And then it goes to, yeah, I have a tempo map here. And then I had it switching to 102 BPM. I'll create a click track so you can hear how that happened. And the click switches. Where is that click? There it is. Hide and make inactive. Yeah, Exciter has been binned for Spectre. I, I do find that Exciter is a little bit better for adding sustain to things. Uh, specifically like a snare bottom mic. If the snare is a little too tight and I want to get some of that, uh, some of that just pshh. Some of that like decay that's just rhythmic to the tempo. Uh, Exciter is awesome for that. And then we've got all these rim shots. So like half of the snare track was him playing rim shots like this. And I didn't want those to have the same gating as the snare and the same like specter to give that top end. So we split that out. I just dragged the waveforms down. Made that into the rim shots. But the biggest part of the snare sound by far are the overheads you know if we fast forward a little bit you know, without the overheads absolutely uh, this is something I picked up from my dad like he always said your close mics should never be responsible for all of the tone of the drum. And it was his belief... <laughs> you guys hear that? It's the squeakiest nonsense of all time. It was his belief system that a set of overhead mics or a set of just all... A set of all-encompassing mics would just kind of all-encompass the drum sound, right? So, so your overheads kind of give you the life. And as you bring up that overhead favor, uh, fader along with all the close mics, it it just envelops the sound and, and creates and completes the picture of the drum set. Uh, so he actually starts with the overheads all the time and he'll get the cymbals dialed in and, and I share this belief that there, you just really get this top end thing from the overheads that you, you don't get any other way. And uh, normally I would be using my 1178 on the overheads. It's tried and true. I'm not the only one doing that. Uh, but this company, Pulsar, just came out with this plugin, and it's the best. I mean, it's ridiculous. Listen to this. It's freaky. And I, I didn't even realize there were all these settings until after the fact. Like, I should have tried out. Like, warm, triode tape. Crazy. I bet if I had saturated with this a little bit more... I wouldn't have needed to kind of get so dynamic and reductive with Soothe. But yeah, 1178 is incredible from Pulsar. But yeah, we had some symbols we had to take care of with Soothe. I think that's why I used this. Doesn't seem like I'm doing very much, though. Yeah, not much at all. You can't use too much of this thing. It's, eh, I just wouldn't. You got to be tasteful with it. Okay. Some sort of cut here. I don't know why. Okay. I don't know. A lot of the times uh, I'm just going through the mix. Everything is unsoloed and we're just, you're kind of in it and you hear some noise. You just reach for something, just pull it out. I don't remember making that move, but it happened. Hi hat. Hi hat is up in the mix with no processing. Ah, C kit. So. You guys will see here that I send quite a bit of things to this compressed kit bus. Pawn shop comp. Terrible example of audio to play for this though. And as you bring that fader in, that just really helps help these things to poke through and bite. You know, without it, 
Without it, and I'll start to fade it in. Pretty sweet. Yeah, I love that thing. Shout out Corniff. Dan Corniff. Uh, toms. Toms are like easily one of the most important things about this style of music. Yeah, crunchy. It is crunchy. Reggae Jr. So like, let's check out what's going on with this fill. You know, without anything. We got some gates. Got some EQ. Some Spectre. Some NLS, which is just the most beautiful way to clip toms in the world. It just is. And by clipping toms, like they can take a hell of a lot of distortion without like needing to like compress them. Like that guy's already hitting so hard. I don't know why you would need to compress each individual channel. Uh, I do it in parallel, so I have this this uh, C tom kit. It's like the, you know, the same settings as the C kit. It's just I like to have it on a different fader, be able to adjust how much of that gets the toms. Plus, if you're if you have one parallel compression bus, like kick, snare, and then your toms too, like the toms can like be overloading the bus, the compressor, and by the time, you know, you get back to one and you need that kick to be strong, the compressor's already down, so you're not getting that envelope to like add the push, right? So by having them all separate, they can all work independently. And you can get more. And then I have another one. My tom sounded really thin, and I was trying to boost low end on the individual toms. Like, this was like mix three or four. So I just decided I'm going to malt out the toms and just make this like really chubby, <laughs> chubby tom track. And that's what this was. And let's listen to it without and with. In the mix without. mix with you know it just adds just such a low low cool thing and then deverb it's like four different i'll just solo out the whole kit for this part i have four different reverbs these are always in my template I always use these deverb i'll bring them all down okay at 26 what do we have here Non-linear gated one. Another one that's the same as that, just kind of different. Super long one. Yeah, and these are mostly revive, different revive settings. You know, the first two, large dense hall, large hall gate. Uh, power snare, that's like super non-linear 80s gated verb. Revive, this is just stock revive. That one is just this open wide thing. Seventh Heaven from Liquid Sonics. Yeah, baby. You're going to see Liquid Sonic stuff all over this session. It's so good. It's so awesome. But like, let's hear actual a groove where we can, you know, measure what the snare is doing. You know, without these verbs. Well, let's do it without, you know, not in the mix at all. Because um, in the mix, these drums sound pretty dry. There's just a little bit of decay. Uh, my friend Alex Awana always says, like, a snare has two parts. You get the hit, you get the impact, you get the transient. Bah! And, you know, you want to shape that to, to hit the right way. And then you've got this decay. You've, you need it to come back down. <sighs> and that's what these verbs do. Because in the mix, it, it sounds pretty dry, but you still need a little bit of that. So here's without verb in the mix. With. You can really hear it there on that fill. And 
And to me, that sounds just inappropriate. It's like without the reverb, because we have a reverby vocal, we have a spacious vocal, we have spacious background vocals, the lead guitar is soaring in the atmosphere, and then we have these dry drums that are right up front. It's not compatible. It doesn't make sense. When you're looking through the lens of this song, hey, you're, you know, you're imagining the reality of where this is being performed, which we don't even have to imagine. We see it. It's right there. It's in this room. Granted, this room doesn't look like it would produce this type of reverb. This is what we went for. You know, this is what it was. Larger than life, bigger reverb, you know. It needs to be there. You got to have a lot of your stuff in the same type of space, I think, to me. that's I, I like it that way. Uh, you know, my friend Greg Scott, UBK, the Kush Audio guy, he he thinks of things like that, but his, his productions are also different, you know. They're like, he'll have... He'll have these drums that are up front in a certain space and and then vocals that are just swimming and soaring and this other and it it works and it's so cohesive. I can't make it work like that. I don't I don't know how to do it. I think it's a good time to look at the bass though, now that we have like the 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 basic kit dialed in. Man, that's tight. Let's loop that. So I've got two of these. Uh, oh, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. These without processing. Yeah, it's just sticking out, you know. So we needed to bring in some EQ, take care of some of this stuff. There's that overtone. That thing doesn't make any sense. It doesn't need to be there. And this? Ooh. No. I like that one. That does help bring some focus in the mix. Uh, but I brought it back later in a different way. I, I wanted to get rid of those overtones and then add a little bit of density and texture just kind of around that in a different spot. Um, pawn Shop Comp. We're not doing much here. We're talking like maybe a quarter of a dB. I don't even know why it's there. Probably didn't need to be there. Spectre. Top end. You know? And Pro Sub. I'm not always doing this, but I'm kind of into it at times. It just really has to be minimal. Like less than 10% usually. But, uh... It just adds an octave below. It's pretty sweet. Ah, really good question. Michael asks, is there a reason why I disabled the fab filter display? <laughs> yes. Uh, Noah will tell anybody that I'm like, I don't complain much, but it's when I do, it's about the fab filter display being on when a session is prepped. Uh, I mean, look at this thing. It is so misleading. I don't want to see it. I don't like, it makes me make decisions that I would have never made if I wasn't looking at it, ever. There are times when it is important, when it's cool. Uh, I have a meter that I really like though, because I'm a super old school guy. Uh, PAZ from Waves. <laughs> this is a testament to somebody who started mixing in the 2000s and not today but uh yeah this thing just makes more sense when i read it you know I'm, I'm looking in rms mode and i'm looking for this downward slope when it's a full mix yeah anyway yeah i don't not super into uh seeing things just because it makes me do st stupid stuff so i have these two alternate tracks yeah use your eyes not your ears that's exactly right bit b I've got these two stereo top end kind of chorus and one of them is just like super high passed chorus 
avid stock chorus. Another one is this just super high-passed Valhalla space modulator. You know, without them, kind of mono. It's rad. How long did it take for the whole mix to come together? Uh, this was like... Oh, God. I did this one at night. So I, I, we put our daughter to bed, and I came in here, and I, this was like 7 o'clock, and I think by 8.45, I was in. And that's something I stole from Michael Brower. He, uh, he would always proclaim that you get to this point in a mix where you know you've been digging and searching and, and just scrounging through the muck and struggling until you hit a point where you're like boom I'm in like this it's there and every decision I will make after this point are these are just little tweaks but like the overall the song is speaking now and now we're in like I'm at a safe point where I could send it and I could feel good about it so I, I think it was like an hour and 45 minutes and I was in I was feeling really good and then the next several days happened. <laughs> so the next day I came in and spent, I think, another hour or two. Uh, and I did one, or I did two things. I sent it to Berna's team, and I also sent it to my friend, Andrew Mori, who is a complete sicko. Complete sicko in the studio. Look at that. Pro Tools quit unexpectedly. Beautiful. It's all right. We'll fire back up while I tell this long story. Um, yeah, and I just said, can you listen to this? You know, I trust your ears, respect you. Uh, and he did. He beat me up pretty good about some things um, in a really productive, challenging way, of course. And he said, you know, there were some things I needed to do with the strings and the background vocals to kind of just voice them. Uh, he told me, your work with these vocals and these strings is, is a bit surgical and like they really fit in. It's clean. But I think they could come forward and speak a little bit more naturally. So he encouraged me to make some like dynamic boosts with EQ. And uh, I will show you guys that stuff once this session opens back up. In the meantime, get a load of this completely disastrous desktop, right? Like what kind of stuff do we have going on here? Oh, check this one out. This is a good one. This is a video of my dad rolling on a... On a whatever that's called. What is this called? Somebody in the chat thread tell me what this is called. And nobody who isn't from the Midwest, the United States, will know what it's called, I bet. Man, good times. Okay, it should be back anytime. Let's see. Pippi asks, where did you start with this mix? Did you listen to the whole track and wait for things to stick out? Or did you break it down by instruments and go through it more structured? It's a, Yeah, it's a thimble. It's a giant thimble. That's what that was. Uh, I started with the drums, just like you saw. I got the drums feeling good because this type of mix, like I said, gospel, R&B, rhythm section. Um, it's all about drums and bass. So what we've done up to this point is how I started. And that was honestly like the first hour of the mix was just getting that stuff working. Because once you have that stuff going, you've got kick and snare, punching the right way, sustaining the right way, moving, pushing air out of the speakers the right way. Everything else will build around it. All of your mid-range instruments will just come into place and you EQ things nicely and massage it, but just bring things in. The mix is going to you know, finish itself. Um, but I think this is a good time to introduce the stereo bus processing because that's what I do at this stage of the game. Let's go to like Onyeka because that's the center song and this has some... Oh, no, that's not Onyeka. Let's go here. This is something I added in later. I don't normally use do this as much, even though I did this on the Twice As Tall album a lot. Uh, compressing the low end. And you guys, turn up your speakers to hear this, and I'll give you a warning before I unmute it, because it's going to blow your shit up. I'm going to turn it off and on. So with these 808s and the kick, it was just, it was just kind of, you know, this was something I was able to do to move fast, to like get this, you know, get things into a place really quickly. And by using this at slow attack speed, it lets 
the transient come through of the kick, right? So we're getting kind of a popping effect in the low end, which feels good. Okay, turn your speakers back down, everybody. Turn the volume down again. There we go. Uh, at some point, I made these moves. I don't know why. I don't remember why. There's that. Uh, this is on every single mix ever, only for the spreader. This is the most... I don't even know how how to express how cool this thing is with words. But this is the best sounding spreader. It's the most phase coherent. It's ridiculous. You can just you can push this stuff out so so wide without losing any impact in the center, without it losing any phase coherency when you flip down to mono and you listen. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It's the best. Nobody's using this. I don't know why. I mean, but just like listen to the width of this compared to the reference. Not crapping on the reference. Emmanuel did a crazy awesome reference. Obviously, I love you, man. But I'm I'm just professing how cool this plugin is. That's all. Yeah, pushes things out. It's beautiful. But then again, I don't want to lean on that too much, right? So if I listen, if I bypass it, you might not even be able to tell it's working. Really, really, really subtle, but it is magical. And when I close my eyes and I try to, you know, I'll always do this. I'll close my eyes and then I'll just, I'll listen and I'll be bypassing and unbypassing. And I don't know which one is which. I just choose, I stop when I hear the one that sounds the best. And on this plugin, it's always off, which is cool. Uh, pull text. So this, these came in later. So the first mix I sent out, and I think this was the first mix I sent to Andrew. This had, I'll play you guys the mix without this thing. It's, it's sad. And for whatever reason, I just wasn't hearing low end right, or maybe I was mixing too loud. I don't know. But this is where it was at. There's no low end. You know, if we look at the meter, it's like I see low end. And then you bring that in. Comes the line. Yep, the classic thing I like to do: boost 16, attenuate 10, which basically means I'm boosting up the top end, like way, 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 way present, silky top. And you know, it brings stuff underneath it too. So it brings up 10k, 11k. I hate 10k. 10k sucks. And so you have to get rid of some of that too. So same thing here, boosting some 30, but it's bringing up a whole bunch of the muck above it. So I'm attenuating a lot of that out. Uh, when I'm making these moves, guys, I'm, I'm closing my eyes and turning the knobs and then stopping when it feels right. You know, because you could really think that turning the knob feels right at eight. Like, oh, it always is good at eight. Like, no, no way. You can't look. I can't. I don't know. It doesn't work for me. Uh, and then we had a little bit of limiting. Look how much limiting isn't happening here. I'm not against limiting. I love loud mixes sometimes. Sometimes you need that. Sometimes things don't hit that level of uh, that level of glue. And sometimes things don't glue right until they're distorting. And that's like sometimes the only distortion you can get is from a limiter. And a lot of the time, that's the way that the client likes it. And, and artists really grow attached to that because they did that with the reference. They produced the song that way. And, you know, there's other ways to recreate it. And, but sometimes there's, sometimes that's just the way to do it. And so I'm not against it. But on this particular tune, we really wanted to go for impact, dynamics, punch, transients, beautiful thing. Metric AB, obviously, this is the last thing in line. You know, I do this all day. AB. Uh, and then listen to audio movers listen to because uh, I like to stream out to my phone and stream out to artists and I send them the link and they can hear the audio straight from the session it's the most amazing tool like I wouldn't have gotten through COVID without it wow 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 ah yes let's let's see some questions oh my god we got a lot of questions and I'm gonna sit up I'm going to change, change my perspective a little bit. Mm, there we go. Get that back going. 
it's kind of an unwritten rule. Once you become a dad, your back starts to hurt a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm not complaining. Okay, I'm going to read through some questions. We'll talk about some stuff. How do you get to use a particular plugin over another? Say Fab Filter over Waves. Uh, I don't know. I I used Waves like EQs and compressors and distortion units forever. And then you just try something new, and you know if it if it's faster, that's usually why I'll why I'll use something. Um, if it sounds superior, I'm really not going to be that guy to claim that a certain EQ sounds superior over another. Um. Especially for those like transparent EQs, like they all sound cool. I was getting cool mixes, like definitely flawed mixes, but I was getting cool mixes with Renaissance EQ and with like stock Pro Tools EQ. I'm not worried about that, uh, dude. Everything's good. Uh, yeah, we could have been using the tools we had, you know, a decade ago, and we would have been fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Working on the foundation of the song. Get it with you. Yep, exactly, exactly. The session looks massive. Did you have to print some process tracks to minimize the computer struggle? Or do you have a specific machine setup? Uh, let's see what the what the power is doing. System usage. You know, 12, 12 cores. It's in around half power. But, I mean, there's no mystery here. It's a big mix, you guys, but... Look how much I'm not doing a lot. I mean, maybe it looks like a lot, but like one to three plugins on some of the tracks. And then look how many tracks don't have processing. Sometimes you just got to know when you don't need to do things, right? And I also, you'll see on these vocals we get to later um, and the strings that I don't process them individually always. On In this mix, I did them all together on buses. And that worked really, really well. Uh, and I'm just using a Mac cheese grater, which is the old Mac Pro, like two, like from 2012, the big, like silver looking one. It's the best. I love it. Um, large space, no outboard on this mix. No outboard, Paul. Nothing in the box. Had fun. I'm like pretty much all in the box now. I, I like to use outboard inserts. I have a a Rev A Blue Stripe 1176 from the late 60s that's almost done being worked on at my text shop. And yeah, I'm going to use that and some of these other pieces, the, uh, the Overstayer and the 1178 and the Distressors, um, this ADA MP1. I have a, a Line 6 pod I'm going to start using for like Chorus and Flanger. And yeah, I'll use that stuff for inserts, but I'll print it right away so then I can go back to offline bounce. I just... And there's no sonic sacrifice. Like, stuff sounds amazing. The plugins are there. You can make it all happen. Uh, Reggae Jr. says, This may be totally irrelevant, but seeing the size of the session, I'm curious about what the sample rate is. It's 48K. Always 48K. Uh, you want to know what my thoughts are on higher sample rates or just leave it at the rate it comes in at? I've done that before, and I've just ended up hating my life. Like, I mixed a 96K song last year, and I was like, oh, I'll just try it. I'll keep it alone. And it's for that type of music. Um, for the type of music I work on, I don't feel that it's incredibly sensitive to sample rates. Uh, I mean, when we're talking like jazz, classical, really high fidelity, lots of dynamics, even then, I don't believe that I would be... Uh, I think I would be hard-pressed to, to hear the difference, to be totally honest. I'm not snobby about that. I'm not snobby about sample rates. I'm not snobby about Spotify's sound quality. I think Spotify sounds sick. I love Spotify. I think it sounds really, really, really good. And I don't know if I can say it's exactly the same as Tidal because technically it's not. And I know that people claim to hear the difference. Uh, I don't want to get totally shamed and hated on here, but I don't hear the difference. I don't care. I think Spotify rocks. Um, dude, I love the purple EQs. Yeah. The on light is hilarious to me. It does nothing, right? Uh, it does do something. I've read the manual cause I was really confused about this. So the on light on purple, let's check this out. It turns on this trim, this like preamp, like tube saturation stage or something like that. And And I just never can hear it. <laughs> I did once when I was like driving 80. I couldn't figure out why I had 808s like causing distortion. 
and it was that. It was like the distortion coming from that. So I just always leave that off now. If I want to do that, I'll do it in a different way. I don't want it to happen there. And yeah. All right, cool. Those were a lot of good questions. Uh, how do you treat the talking drums, please? Yes. Yes, we should talk about the talking drums. Mm. Let's do it. Thank you for hanging out, guys. This is cool. Way cool. All right. Talking drums. This was a big deal because the first mix I turned in, I didn't have the video to reference. And I just heard all of these drums. And I thought, man, this stuff is, this is really distracting <laughs> from the actual groove. And I needed to figure out how to treat it. It was a big challenge. And here's what I'm talking about. But of course, I got the video, you know, and you watch this. As soon as I got the cut with the video, I had to remix the song with like literally like 15 dB more talking drums. Because when you watch this, like, look at these guys. I gotta be honest. This sounds, this sounds sick. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm, I'm just, I am praising this group. I'm so thankful I was able to be a part of this. So I got this aux called Percussion Verb, which is Cinematic Rooms from Liquid Sonics. So check it out without this, without that thing. Yep. Pretty sweet. Let's go one by one. What's going on on this thing? Yeah, that's classic too much 1K kind of a thing. You know? It just that doesn't sound like a clap to me. That sounds like... And a lot of the time, we can let the drums take up the mid-range. We can, you know, we don't need the clap to take up the mid-range too, you know? Although, we just want that top-end sizzle of the clap, right? So by scooping all that stuff out, it just leaves the top end. Uh, yeah, you guys, I'll, I'll upload this one. I think I'm going to edit it because I was a bit uh, a bit nervous and stuttery in the beginning. But uh, yeah, we'll get this up. Ah, uh, this thing. This thing's cool. I think I did a little EQ in the mids just to... There's Spectre again, just bringing life. I love the tube setting. Sometimes rectifies cool. I love solid in the top end, actually, too, but... shaker nothing going on and then as you can see like you know 10 tracks in a row where i didn't do anything for whatever reason these didn't require processing yeah your fader is your eq for that right so just turn those up uh and then the talking drums are all sent to a bus let's see what we did Yep, they're just a little bloated. Duh. You know, you can hear that frequency. Mm. And then added some Spectre, just to give them a little presence. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, what are these guys? What's going on here? Oh, I actually, I really nuked these hard. Check this out. Oh, dude. Omega Transformer. These are the best plugins ever. These are like 30 bucks each, and they're they're just the coolest. This, this stuff is amazing. Check it out. Let me find where I'm at so I can find maybe a better point. Oh, Pro Tools, don't do it. Don't do it. We got the spinning wheel, y'all. I'll see when it goes away. Reggae Jr., thanks for the kind words, man. appreciate it. Yeah, Paul's Paul's hip to the Kush Omegas, too. Yes, Bachtown, that is from the House of Kush guy. That's Greg Scott, UBK. And, dude, that guy makes the craziest products. Uh, the Pippi says, I've seen Spectre a lot throughout this project. Sorry if it's a silly question, but is an EQ? Is there much difference between Spectre and FabFilter's EQ? Yes. Yes. It's actually not an EQ. It boosts 
saturation. So it's like it's more like Saturn in a way, right? So you pick a region and you distort it with different types of distortion. But it's different than Saturn because it doesn't have these crossover points. So they're individual just bands. So you have these just bands of distortion. So instead of just like taking an EQ where you're boosting a filter, so you're raising the level of that area, right? It's it's actually distorting it, so you're getting all of this extra information and texture and density. I'm going to force quit Pro Tools. You guys can look at my hilarious desktop again. Should we watch the Thimble video again while we wait? Ha, 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 ha. That's Master Mixer, Todd Ernster. Oh, here's another one while we wait. Look at this. Look at Jesse 10 years ago trying too hard. The same NS10s I'm using here. We got a little 610, my first preamp. Oh, man. My first panels, music note panels. Good times. Okay. Pro Tools. Open most recent session. But yeah, what I was going to say with those Cush Omegas is I love that stuff on Afrobeat percussion because there's so much dynamic range. And there's so many tingy, just harsh upper mid, upper like frequencies. And these things go like... And by driving into something like that, you're clipping the top end, you're clipping the transients, not the top end, but you're clipping the transients, and you're getting a more even performance, and it's soft. The, the Omega N softens the upper mids. It makes that stuff softer, and it's almost like using Soothe where you want to like reduce those frequencies, and man, it works really well for that. This desktop is atrocious. I'm so sorry everybody's having to see that. You know, is what it is. Shout out City Girl. You guys, go listen to that mix. That's like the coolest song I did last year. All right, we'll get this guy back open. Let's see, we've got some questions. Didn't know it wasn't an EQ. Yeah, dude. Spectre is not an EQ. But, you know, I treat it like an EQ. You just think about it the same. But, like, when you do a boost in the top end with Fab Filter, and then you do a boost in the top end with, like, Spectre, man, you hear it. It's... It has texture. Suddenly, it's not just a clean boost of energy in that area. It's it, it adds, you know. There's you can feel sizzle and gravel and like here. Check it out. I'll do it right here. Like if I boost with rectify mode, So what did this sound like before these plugins? Yeah, anyway, just a little bit of clipping going on there. How about this one? Oh, I'm on. Man, why does it jump to X or solo mode sometimes? That's just the worst. What's this guy doing? Like there, just kind of distorting it made it make way more sense in the mix. Otherwise it's just like click, 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 click. And same here with these ones. And I would even now be a little more tempted to take out some of that woo. You know, and then maybe bring Spectre in and allow that to. You know, like how's that gonna fit in a mix? It's just it's just low endy and muddy and it's never gonna happen. But if you turn on the processing. And then maybe turn it up. Now you can hear it, you know. I'm going to put that back. I'll leave that processing on, though. Who cares? That's cool. we got some cymbal rolls. And for some reason, I sent the cymbal roll to a percussion verb. That was definitely a mistake. Whatever. Oh, I have a per compressed snare track, too. Oh, no, I don't. That's not doing anything. Hide and make inactive. Bell noise. we got some bells here. Okay, underwhelming. Chimes. 
super gospel. That's important to have. It's kind of hurt, but that's sort of what chimes do. Uh, guitar clean at the beginning of Onyeka. You know, usual thing. Doing some cuts, doing a little bit of additive stuff, and but then I have this bus called G Delay, which has my favorite combo of H Delay, feeding cinematic rooms, and then just filtering out some stuff. And listen how it fades in. And I also have some lead guitars that go to that same bus. And that automation move that you guys see right there, that's getting the verb out of the way so his vocal could, you know, occupy the space. You know, if we look at the clip gain volume here, we can see <clears throat> view, clip, gain, line. We can see there's a, a good amount of automation here just making sure that this lead guitar stays audible throughout the end. And, you know, with any mix, these things aren't ever perfect. So I I immediately just, like, wish that I had <clears throat> turned up this little lick. Check this out. Oh, where am I? Okay. Where is it here? up here yeah I should have turned that up check this out yeah we're gonna leave that split the difference <clears throat> Right, Bachtown asks, yeah, you guys ask, ask some questions. Let's do a couple questions. A little ear break. Uh, how loud do you have your monitors when doing most of the mixing? I would say I mix pretty quietly to get the balances and the feel and, and get the honesty from the transients and also the upper mid-range. But when dialing in that initial like kick, kick up, bass up, 808 up, get the feel of the low end that's where i'm like i'm stomping it pretty hard i'm turning things up uh it's gonna all change when i'm in the new room like i've been mixing on near fields my entire life and i'm gonna be mixing on midfield monitors i'm gonna be like seven feet away from the speakers you know i'm literally like two feet from these right now it's not right <clears throat> so uh we'll find out how things are gonna change um and hurting your ears over this is a sweet spot. Yeah, you've you've got to listen. You can't like crank it up all day. You'll you'll lose it pretty fast. It's like when you you get fatigued and then you're mixing towards the end of the day. You come back the next day and hear the things you did at the end of the day, and it was just like, man, I was deaf. I turned up all the top end. Like, what was going on? Yeah, you got to take breaks. Uh, ever had a time you worked with Logic Pro X? If not, would you do all these things in Logic still? Or why do you choose Pro Tools? Just industry standards or you got personal reasons? Please talk about it. Eight notes. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I will. Yeah, so Logic was actually like the first DAW I got on my laptop. So we already had Pro Tools at the house. Like my dad had Pro Tools. He was working on it. I kind of knew it a little bit. Um, but technically Logic was, I mean, after like, you know, recording on tape, like cassette tape <laughs> and then GarageBand. Logic Pro was like, 
kind of my first dive into a recording software where I like really began to practice mixing. And it worked. I was on my particular machine. I had this like really unique glitch and like these this certain set of bugs that just like wouldn't allow me to have more than like eight or nine tracks. And it was so obnoxious. And I downloaded like a ripped copy of Pro Tools. It was Pro Tools 8. And it worked perfectly. And I was able to do these, you know, 100 track mixes and, and like actually record without being, you know, completely stopped by technology, which can be so frustrating. Uh, so I just kind of was off to the races and it just made sense to stay in Pro Tools because my dad had the, the really big Pro Tools rig and that's where I did a lot of the drum recording. And, and yeah, and now I'm just, it would take way too long to invest time to learn something else. I have all the shortcuts down. I feel like I move pretty quickly, at least for what I need to do. And yeah, and it is a bit of an industry standard, but honestly, I bet 95% of the mixes we get in were not tracked in Pro Tools. And, you know, my assistant Noah has Logic and Ableton. And we're able to, we usually take their sessions and we can we can get stems printed out of there. And then I load them into here and we mix in Pro Tools and it's cool. Um, Logic is great though. If I were mixing in Logic, I would do all the same stuff. Um, I know guys that are killing it in Logic and doing way better sounding stuff than me. A mix is never perfected. It is surrendered. Real Darian. Absolute facts. Cruising the stream, brother. Crushing the stream. But we're also cruising it. Uh, what do you use to get your DAW audio through OBS? Do you have to go through the Soundflower route? Thanks for a great informative system. Yeah, you you know what's going on. You know the struggle of that, it sounds like. Um, I will show you. So for these streams, I have to like... I have an Avid HDIO interface, and it doesn't work with this. So I actually have to go into setup, playback engine. I have to use just built-in digital out. So just like straight up left and right out through the interface. And then when I do that, I use loopback, and that takes the audio from Pro Tools and sends it into this uh, custom IO that I built called JRE Stream. And then that is what goes into OBS. And I think you can learn more about, I don't remember, so, so long ago I did this, but sound... So, oh, it's like, I think you open like the sound and MIDI preferences and that's how you get to that. And you can build your own like output. Not build. I guess build is the wrong word, but yeah, that's how I do that. Okay. Just look at these vocals. I got through guitar and you know, there's tons of synths and stuff. They're all pretty self-explanatory um definitely if i'm like skipping over stuff you guys want to see just let me know bada big drums oh cello let's go to the cellos and strings first This is where Gulfos really excels, one of the many ways. Um, just, you know, we're able to tame some of that mid-range dynamically when it needs to. And at the exact same time, it's doing the move I was going to do. You know, typically I would do a cut on the mids, and then I'd go in after and do a boost in the top end on strings, right? And Gulfos just does it. Fantastic. Um, and these are things, you know, it looks ridiculous, and it might not sound better soloed but in the mix this this stuff just made more sense these moves so this thank you andrew mori uh this is what he was encouraging me to do this is a dynamic boost <laughs> 8.76 db at 600 hertz because before that this is what they sounded like Maybe a little thinned out. I mean, it sounds right to me, honestly. I don't really regret where it was. But in order for it to push through, it needed some thickness, and that brought the natural sound back, like immediately right away. 
that worked. So that's a boost that also is reducing dynamically, right? You can see it kind of quivering. So depending on how much signal it gets, it's it's reducting. Reducting. Reducing. <laughs> And uh, these strings were, all of them just processed together. You know, massive mix. You've got to keep going. Like, I need to get a song, like, feeling right within the first couple of hours. Or else, like, your perspective. Like, you can only hear the thing first uh, for the first time once. And the more you go on something, the more it gets lost. And you end up chasing your tail. And, like, I hate getting to that position because it's frustrating and the producer and the art, they know it. Everybody knows it. It's just like, man, we're not getting there. Why didn't, you know? And I've seen the way that some people mix and then you're going through one stem at a time, soloing it out and like spending five minutes on each stem, like really getting the perfect EQ on your shaker. Like, dude, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Let's get some results. Get some, throw some paint on the canvas. Get some pencil on the paper. And, uh, you know, for this particular scenario, it worked. A lot of the time, if you're trying to, like, mass EQ cellos, violas, violins, uh, it, it's not going to work. But this time it did, and it was cool. I also have, uh, I have lustrous plates and cinematic rooms in parallel. You listen to these strings without it. You know, and then with, if I really exaggerate it. It's gorgeous. Sounds like a video game soundtrack. About to slay the dragon, baby. Strings, wet, mix, one. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's their, they sent me a mix of what they had. And, uh. at zero I considered using it it just felt it felt a little dense and mono and I wanted to spread that out and that's why we went with what we went with all right have a lot to learn let's go to the choir voices now would you ever use Gulf Oss? Why would you ever use it over Soothe on the strings? Uh, I use Soothe very occasionally for reductive purposes. Um, when there's just harshness in the upper mids. Or it's really cool on acoustic guitars and like the low mids to get some of the mm out if it wasn't mic'd properly. Or it's uneven. And you know, if somebody's moving in and out of the, of the mic with an acoustic guitar and you're getting more and less mids, it's just not consistent. That, that could be really cool for that. Uh, Gulf Oss is just this... I, yeah, I, Gulf Oss takes the, yeah, takes the cake for this application for sure. So it only boosts at low volume sections regarding the, oh yeah, yeah, Bachtown, the, that boost, no, it's, it's always boosted, but when it gets hit really hard with signal, it just reduces. So it's like, if you want to turn something up, but you want the computer to help you turn it back down when things are getting a little too chaotic, that's what that would be good for. Uh, Nord Piano. I have to put away this clip gain line. That's driving me nuts. Okay. You know, tons of Pro-Q followed by Spectre. And pianos are tough, man. You really got to split it out. When it's by itself, you can leave all the lows. You know, that could have probably been louder in the intro. You know, if it were me, I mean, the first two are plenty loud, but the third one isn't. Yeah, I would turn that guy up. Boom, 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 boom. Turn these last two up one more dB each. This is just an example of how I go through and do some automation to level some stuff. 
and then boom, these guys like come all the way up. It's loud now. We got to make up for it. You can't set it and forget it. Like a compressor, you know, you can put things on the level. It's lazy. It's lazy and you're losing transients and, you know, that wouldn't be the way to handle this because part of what makes a piano pop on like a gospel style arrangement is, is that poke. You want it to poke. I'm EQing it to be pokey. Like this thing is living in the upper mid range. That's the intention. You know, that second hit was too loud, though, so we'll bring that back down. Too loud still. Too loud and also offbeat. So you might, you know, I might take that and move it back in a little bit closer. I kind of take this guy. Boom, boom, boom. See, it wasn't too loud. It was flamming with the kick, which made it seem like it was too loud, right? So we fixed some of that timing stuff. Don't be, you can't, you know, can't be afraid to do things like that. An artist is never going to hit you back and say, like, man, why did you? Well, they might, if it's a vocal. <laughs> but still, it, it helps. They do? Like, whatever. You know, they're not going to get mad that you tried to do something to help the arrangement. Sometimes, like, a really loose feel is the thing. You know, you can't take a Dilla groove on, on a drum kit and, and fix that. Like, that's never going to work. Some things need to be intentionally musical, stylistically ignorant and cool and lazy and, and back. You know, pocket is a really widely uh, varying term. Real Darian, uh, I don't know about MIDI controller mixers. You, you talking about like the Avid S1 or just like little fader fader boxes? Um, I don't need that stuff. I, I like the mouse. I'm cool with the mouse. Saxophone. We got some saxophone delay. I used a CLA 76 here. <laughs> That's the funniest thing in the world. I haven't used that in ages, but I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Yeah, listen. Yeah, sweet. And then there's just a whole bunch of random stuff that we can just kind of blast over here. Um, okay, I have this major vocal thing called Big BGV. Yeah, we'll listen to this. And all of these background vocals, in addition to that one, these are all being grouped. A little bit of EQ. Novatron. It's the best. Oh my gosh, this thing's amazing. Spectre, a little bit of high shelf, and a little bit more EQ doing the thing, doing the thing that Andrew told me to do. Boost those guys up. So listen to what these were doing before that. Without her. This thing really just pushed it forward. It brought in that voice, like, man, I was overdoing it. I was, I was totally overdoing it. So these vocals are really cool. Once we bring in this, uh, these effects, I have a slap delay, uh, kind of a micro shift delayed thing, an eighth note delay, quarter note delay, and seventh heaven again. And if we listen at the top. And I also have this other track of intro vocals. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And uh, here's without plugins. 
You know, in the reference. Super cool. Let's talk about Berna's lead vocal. One dB of EQ. That's for that part of the song. What did we do on this part? Quite a bit of EQ because, man, there's it was a bad microphone recording for this. Yeah, that, that was difficult. And what did we do on his vocal here? I didn't record or mix the vocals from this song, so... Uh, originally, so doing this... Yeah, it, it was pretty s -y. Ouch. You are gone. Oh, the Bentley. So on all the lead vocals, we got this Amber 3 doing approximately 0.25 dB at the top end, which is super unnecessary and probably didn't even need to happen. And then just a little tiny bit of Spectre there in the top end too. Without it, it sounds... Now we're back here. That kind of just lifts the veil a little bit, brings it up out of the uh, out of the dark, out of the shadows. Very subtle EQing overall, though. Any specific reason for that, or just because no more is needed? Uh, I'll tell you why I didn't do more because no more was needed. Do what's necessary. I, I could show you guys like a pile of other sessions that I that I do that are like too too much, too crazy. Uh some of those memes where you see like 50,000 things of EQ. Like, yeah, I'm guilty of that sometimes when you need to. Uh, in this scenario, this stuff was so brilliantly engineered and meticulously crafted. Like, there are no accidents with this arrangement. Like, at all. It was all, it, the intent was perfect. And it was just exactly where it needed to be. Uh, you know, the strings fit where the strings fit. The vocals fit where the vocals fit. You know, you're gonna need to engineer a drum kit. You gotta, you gotta mix drums. That's that's always gonna be the case for live stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, this is this is like the dream best case scenario for a for a big production like this. Because uh, I've done some other, like I've got the on YouTube. I have the uh, the Ripley's Believe It or Not thing that I composed and mixed. And that's like a massive production. But because it was all programmed and, you know, maybe not done the best way possible. And I'm not like a master composer. I did a lot of just stacking and putting things in the same frequency range. So I had to like over mix it to get it to work. And You know, that's a pretty old video now. You can go up and watch that on YouTube. But this is like a similar production, but like way easier. I struggled with it far less. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So, uh, that's, that's kind of the end of the session. You know, we could just, uh, open it up and, and do some Q&A if you guys want to, or if you want to hear anything again, we could just, uh, blast through maybe one more time while you guys ask some questions. I'll just hit play and we can just reference the... We can pull up the video again, and we can reference the original mix. Here we go. Up. 
If you're feeling like you can't level up, I'ma make you now stop our time. Because right when you start feeling like you can't level up, that's when you have to shut the devil up. I'm a number one, I couldn't level up. I'm a money, couldn't level up. Don't worry, I'm like this, always another level up. So I Every day me try level up, so me striking them hard, me go hard until I get to God. Had a few questions. <clears throat> Can we see more of the vocal effects? Yeah. And this kind of coincides with the next question too. The vocals really pop compared to the reference. Is that mostly a volume boost or an EQ thing? Uh, yeah, both. Definitely both. Um, but also, you know, the vocals pop out on the reference. I'm sorry, the, the lack of vocals pops out on the reference when comparing to my mix. But I don't think that it's necessarily that the vocals are so much forward in mine i think that that's heavily attributed to the fact that i have like carved out space in the mid-range maybe not even intentionally but i think i've just taken care of so much of the mid-range that was fighting you know you, you see on every eq i'm like just there's a lot of scooping going on and i think that just makes a place for the vocal to sit more easily right um but as far as the vocal effects we were asking about those uh, let's take a look. Let's go all the way down. I do my lead vocals in red always. So we got the lead vocals, and they're sent out to these this stuff. We've got time adjuster one and time adjuster two. <clears throat> let's hit play here. I'll kind of show you what these do. This is like like a micro shift kind of thing. Uh, it's not micro shift. I use it with time adjuster, so I do like a. And this is something I got from my friend Kaylin. AKA District Sound Labs, the man. Uh, 
So I got a couple of them. And, but what I do differently is I, I feed them into some distortion. So I distort CLA Mix Hub and then I distort Lo-Fi. And I bring these two in. I blend them in like... You know, and then when you're able to bring that in, it kind of make, takes your vocal from mono to stereo in a bit, right? You know, Sunday, when do you come in like, oh, yeah, go, when do and if you keep, I could, but just a little bit, you know, if I muted it, it's not massively different. You know, Sunday, when do you come in like, oh, yeah, go, when do and if you keep, you know, you don't want to rely on any one thing to do the heavy lifting on a sound, except for the performer and the vocal and the, the instruments themselves, right? Uh, after that guy, we've got some Lustrous verb. You know, Sunday, when do you come in like a yeta when no lustrous place? I could take you, oh, shake you. I still test out your case. And now, when I'm compressing the signal that goes into it, so the vocal wouldn't like freak out on certain words. Seventh heaven, you don't do your booty now, your body better. Some mob three doing like a slap. Never, never, never make a Let's see. Regretta. Then we got a ping pong. Kate delay doing a ping pong. And Valhalla delay quarter note. Quarter notes doing the heavy lifting. And the quarter note is uh, you know, kind of does this sort of thing. You know, Sunday when do you come in like on yet a when no? And if you keep, I could take you, oh, shake you. Without the effects. I still test out your case, you make a no come make a mistake, you. Of course, there are delays in their stem too, so, so that's cool. Uh, let's see what's going on here on the chat. Mix Giant's back. Mix Giant, you had it, you were out for a while. We were talking about you. It was fun. I want to see more of the vocal. How's your experience working with Kanye? Because I've heard he keeps making changes last minute. Uh, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> uh, so I was with Kanye in Chicago for a few weeks, and then we were in Uganda for another week working on Yandi, which became Jesus is King, which is like the couple of tunes I worked on are on that. And yeah, so, but really I wasn't around for like album mode. Like when they go in and they're camped out and they're, you know, they're cooking up a record and making changes. I wasn't around for that. I, I can't speak to that. I can't attest to it. Uh, I know that I love the finished product. I love what those guys do. Shout out Jess Jackson, Mike Dean. Uh, this makes it sound incredible, you know? Like that, that team, they execute. They absolutely execute. The amount of space and width that you've found is great. Adds so much more texture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, that's, that's the mix. That's the mix, y'all. Thanks for running up the streams on twice as tall and contributing to the overall impact of this. I know we have uh, viewers on this Twitch right now that are all around the world. And uh, Berna's impact and his, you know, his reach is, is really incredible. And we're all really thankful. It's, it's a special thing. And uh, it's special music. It's, it's good. It feels really good to achieve that with special people that, that you're friends with. And yeah, it's beautiful. And I'm, even if we didn't win, like just getting to celebrate and watch this performance that we worked on, like leading up to the Grammys, uh, it was really cool. And to hear it on, you know, national television, well, I guess it was the internet, you know, it was, CBS or Paramount Plus, right? Is that what they're calling it now? That was pretty cool. And they didn't compress it to death, so the, the final mix survived the added layers of whatever they do to the processing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Much love from Nigeria. Awesome. Love y'all in Nigeria. Uh, out of curiosity, any chance in the future you could do a session like this for some of Goody Grace's tracks that you've worked on? In love with that album at the moment. What songs? What, what would you like to hear? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll need to get clearance from him and Atlantic Records, but I think we could. I think we could do it. The Goody stuff is so cool because when I moved into this house, I started this little mix room in this tiny bedroom. I'm in this super small room right now. Excited for that new studio. Uh, and Goody came over and we mixed that stuff in here and like i think a couple weeks later i mixed anybody the first single for uh well not the first signal but the first single i mixed for african giant and then after that it just it all kind of took off from there and it's all happened in this room and now this room is kind of coming to a close as i'm moving out into the new studio out back 
And yeah, it's going to be really special to see what that chapter uh, brings. So it'll be really cool. I hope you guys, uh, hope you come along and, and we can do some more Twitch streaming soon. I'm not going to be like doing this on the regular. Uh, it's been like a super busy time. We have another baby on the way. So life is good. Family's good. Um, but yeah, yeah. When we're able to lock in, let's, let's do this again. And you guys hit me up, you know, shoot me some DMs. If you have any other questions, if you want to send me some stuff you're working on, I'm always down to listen to some mixes when I have a chance. I can give some feedback. I'm I try to reach out and be a part of the community in that way. And I sometimes I don't respond, so forgive me, but just uh, just hit me back again. Just be like, yo, did you see this? And I'll say yes or no. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Bucktown, how's the studio coming along? It's great. It's good. They're, uh, they're finishing up all the drywall in there. It's a cool space. So it's a garage that's been my, like, garage slash, like, work, like, tool area for basically storing boxes and building crap for the last two years and now it's we're converting it heavily insulated it framed um yeah vaulted ceilings nice 12 foot vaulted ceilings uh big mixed room it's gonna be 13 feet by 19 feet deep maybe not big but bigger than this this room is what 10 feet by 12 i think yeah and the new room is going to be fully outfitted with 27 inch isothermal tube traps all along loaded on the front wall the back wall and then in an attack wall configuration around the listening position with the strauss mf4 midfield monitors it's going to be serious <laughs> it's, it's going to be a powerhouse so that's how the studio is coming along oh awesome 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 well thank you guys this is great yeah hit me up and uh i will get this kind of edited and and re-uploaded to twitch and youtube and hopefully you guys get some value from it cool uh, happy Saturday. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you guys later. Peace.